And I remember thinking, oh God, I really don't want to do it. And it was one of the lower moments of the game. But then straight away, the rain comes down. And while we're waiting, before the challenge starts, I remember we huddled under that tree. Um, I think you, you were on the bench. So the people who were playing were, were huddled under this tree. And as they were saying, like, it's okay. Like, you know, your mum's here. She's going to be watching over you. About 2,000 butterflies burst out of the tree we were standing under and just took off into the rain. And it's like, wow, like, I'm alive. Like, there is something greater happening here about my connection to this moment, my connection to my mum. Welcome to the To Be Human podcast, Nick Idanza. Woo! Thanks for having me, Jen. <laughs> so good to see you. It's, um, it's, this is, who would have thought? Who would have thought all those years ago I would be here recording on your podcast? I profoundly agree with that. Who would have thought that you'd be the first survivor person that I'd have on yeah. my podcast? <laughs> very good, very you, good. You win. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I've been listening along. It's been awesome. And I, I'm a big fan of yours, obviously, a big fan of your oh. podcast. So I feel very honored. And I don't feel worthy. And let's just say that we've got oh. these. All these amazing uh, ultra marathon runners, people that have done all these like amazing things in life. And it's like, here's Nick I dance. <laughs> <laughs> Starved on an island a couple of times and, you know, did a few things in Adelaide. <laughs> in Adelaide. Uh, I, I, I think a lot more highly of you than that. So. <laughs> Thank and you. I'm Hopefully sure we'll we be something. talking about these things as it proceeds. <laughs> but it's good to see what you think about yourself, Mr. Imposter, over there. <laughs> yeah, all those people who say I'm cocky, there you go. There you yeah, go. yeah. <laughs> yeah tell, talk to me about your deepest fear, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, welcome. And you. so as you're aware... Um, being an avid listener, apparently that you are. I normally start this podcast with a quote um, that I share with the guest of theirs. Um, but as we've discussed, I thought it was a great opportunity this morning to try something a little different. And that's because I know that you absolutely love and are very talented in writing poetry. And you set yourself. Well, one of those statements is correct. One of those. <laughs> The talented talented bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, you set yourself a challenge of writing a meaningful poem um, every year. And I think this may have been the first one that you mm -hmm. set yourself the challenge with. And I've obviously read it and um, it deeply touched me. So I'd love if we start this podcast, podcast off with you sharing the poem the last time that you've written and then proceed to share with me about that very defining moment in your life. Sure. So um, um, a little bit of preamble. So this is a poem. This is one of the first poems I wrote, um, and it was written after the death of my mother. Um, and it was about the last time that we were able to take her to the beach before she passed away. Um, she was battling cancer for a very long time. Um, and it kind of was written from her perspective and just her kind of observing because I have a photo that I've taken of her. Just she was sitting there in her deck chair, like staring out at the sea and it was this big blue sky behind her and big bright umbrella. And I just kind of like really like discreetly snapped a photo of her just kind of like contemplating. And I knew that it was, it was Australia day, 2010. Um, and I knew that it was the last time we all knew that it was the last time we we're ever going to go to the beach. Um, and she knew it as well. And it was kind of like the subtext of the, the whole day. So yeah, so this is the poem, the last time. I know it's the last time I'll be here in my sacred place. I know it's the last time I'll be here. The sea breezes past my face. Familiar faces frolic in the sand, a place untouched by illness's hand. I knew this is where we had to go. How long to the end? I think I know. Every step of my life has been charted here. Each trip, a memory I'll always hold dear. Nostalgia crashes on me like the waves on the shore. Childhood, ice blocks, tanning, precious memories forevermore. But now that I know the battle's almost done, I need one last day with my family in the sun. I look out to the horizon and think of how I'm blessed. Let the sun roll upon me before I take my final rest. Contemplation's constant companion. The final chapter is drawing near. We all know this is truly peace. I have nothing left to fear. I know it's the last time we'll be here. 
I smile at my son and try to stretch out the day. I know it's the last time we'll be here. Real laughs and memories more than words could ever say. So, yes. So that's the beautiful. poem. <laughs> it's so beautiful. So, obviously, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. So, obviously, that was um, a very important part of your life. And I start the podcast off with this because I know that you are so deeply a family man. And um, in our friendship, basically from the start, you know, this was a story that that you shared very vulnerably and it was still very close to home, I felt, even, you know, five, six years ago. Um, yeah. Can you share sort of, I, I know this, uh, this was 2010 and this was a time that I, I think you kind of share is like on the cusp of adulthood Mm, how did this experience kind of begin to transform you from someone that was a teenager sort of into a man yeah it's really interesting question because like I love hearing stories about people who have gone through you know traumatic experiences and come out the other end um and I remember thinking at the time that like I just couldn't see the end um and I think just because it happened at such like a formative time of my life like I wasn't a kid but I wasn't an adult. I had, so to give you some background, um, on my first day of year 12, so I was um, 16 at the time, um, I am, we found out that my mum had cancer, um, breast cancer, and it was a huge shock to our entire family. Um, and they said that she had a couple of years to live. Um, so we, you know, she fought and battled on, but we knew there was always an end point um, she ended up surviving five years um, and we knew that it was really, really coming to a close at that point. Um, but it was kind of, and we, we thought we were ready, right? We thought we were prepared. We thought we had said what we needed to say and that, you know, we still had a couple more years, but, you know, no matter what we had, you know, we, we, we were mature in the face of this trauma. But then on New Year's Eve going into 2010, my mum had a seizure and a stroke. Um, It was probably the one of the most traumatic experiences of my life, like waking up that morning and we went into her bedroom and she was convulsing. And um, yeah, if anyone's uh, been with someone when they've gone through a seizure and a stroke at the same time, um, yeah, the horrible things it does to the face and the body. And it was just this um, thing that accelerated what we knew was already the end of this conveyor belt. Right. And um, she recovered the ne- that day in hospital, the next day when she kind of fan- came to, she had lost all her memory. So we thought we were ready. <laughs> we thought we were, we could say goodbye, but you know, it was kind of sped up and just kind of happened. Um, and what was really strange about that is that kind of like this kind of formative period of my life, like, you know, finishing school, we found out on the day that I was starting year 12 and she had her seizure just before my first day of becoming a teacher. I had gone to uni for four years and had spent those four years, um, you know, looking after her and caring for her. And um, after a month of um, palliative care, um, she eventually passed um, a couple of weeks into February. um, And she, it was just, it was just such a really strange time because like, she always wanted me to be a teacher and the first day of my teaching, you know, my first day, first job, you know, so excited, so stressed. She was able to kind of get out of bed and walk me to the letterbox and, um, and, and wave me goodbye. And um, yeah, then she went, took a turn that day and then eventually, and it went into kind of complete um, downward spiral for the last two weeks. So I just feel like my, journey into adulthood was bookended by this really traumatic experience um which was i it was traumatic at the time but one of the things and i know that you and i have spoken about this before and one of the things that i often find really strange to say and verbalize is that i'm actually really glad that my mum got sick um i know a lot of people who have much uh more traumatic things where you know they get a call one day and their relatives have passed away or or sometimes you know people just kind of peter out of people's lives we were at least able to kind of know what was coming and have these kind of great family moments and these great family discussions and prepare as best as you can but it still doesn't take away the fact that yeah my formative years of life were kind of like encompassed by this yeah this really dark time I guess And I know that you shared that, like, you know, you had time to 
share with your mom like things that needed to be said during that time did it help you reflect on what was important by by sort of I guess weeding out what was like necessary to be said to someone that may sort of leave you at some point yeah and I think anyone who has who knows the end is coming for themselves or for a loved one can kind of relate to this experience where you're kind of on a tightrope where you 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 don't if you if you, you you're navigating this fine line where you want to say everything because you know it's almost over but you also want to remind don't want to remind them that it's going to be over so you don't want to you know spend every day being like you know what's your last words or you know what do you want to say to my grand your grandkids one day that you'll never meet you don't want to remind people of their impending mortality so you you always kind of like have this fine line that you would that we were trying to navigate um and you know I look back now and I wish I had said more stuff even though I got to say plenty but I think by virtue of that is that I was 17 I was 18 I was 19 I didn't really know I was doing the best that I could with this really um difficult situation that now I know as a 30 something year old with kids I would navigate again completely different but um yeah, you do kind of beat yourself up that, oh, maybe I should have said this. Or, you know, we did try and record a lot of stuff. Um, and I remember, you know, in hospital, um, we there was one moment actually that I want to share that um, she was lying in hospital bed and she was kind of like in and out of it. It was probably one of her more lucid days. And my sisters and I were kind of asking her questions and recording it. Um, and I just came out and said, I said, what's a piece of life advice, mum, you'll give me that I can carry with me? forever something that you've learned along the way and I don't know whether it was because she was just like super profound or if she was like so out of it that she just offhandedly said go find out for yourself and I I love that like I love that line like I want to get that tattooed on my on my body like that is such a profound statement that like even if it did come out of this kind of you know memory fog where she wasn't quite sure what we were doing and was you know or whether she actually was kind of like digging in deep and pulling out this really important piece of information it's a piece of information that I've carried with me all the time and it's almost like a bit of a life motto and I remember when I was applying for Survivor and you know when I was taking on jobs and doing things in my personal life and I had my own podcast you know every time I would just kind of filter it through the prism of this phrase like go find out for yourself like don't wait and see if someone else is going to tell you what their experiences were like, just go and do it. Like, and that's kind of how my mom lived her life. She was very vivacious. You know, she was um, uh, one of the best um, dressmakers in Adelaide. She was a like a master netball player and a netball coach. She um, was children of migrants who kind of like lived this amazing life. And she just did everything that you could imagine. And every a lot of it was her going and finding out for herself because she was a child of migrants who didn't really do much with their life other than kind of like, well, that sounds reductive, but like they lived to work to survive. They didn't live to thrive. And she definitely went out and found out for herself what life was like. So yeah, that's a little, a little uh, phrase that I'll always keep with me. Yeah. I think that's beautiful advice. And I certainly resonate with that. I feel like, you know, in this day and age, we have, like mass information and you know with all our questions it's like we're we're trying to sort through what's you know what's correct and what's not correct and I know in my own personal life recently it's like you know podcasts for example like they do help but at some point you really need to ask the questions to yourself and really tap into Mm -hmm. your heart center or your intuition or actually proactively get out there and do it and I feel like it's yeah it is very profound advice because I think we sometimes tend to lean on too much other people's um sort of way of life that is just so different to how we may experience it yeah well I think that's why I kind of you know you know we've spoken a lot over the years but I feel like you starting this podcast is an example of you going out there and just figuring it out for yourself like that you know you do have to take those risks like you do have to just take that leap of faith you know, and, you know, everyone you've spoken to so far has done, taken these kind of leaps of faith. Um, 
and you and I had took a leap of faith when we were on Survivor. And like, you know, that's a thing that could end really badly or end really well or, you know, but you don't know until you put yourself out there. So in relation to your family being um, immigrants, because I know that that is sort of an important part of something that you're really proud of is that your background, you know, you see is like your your family being really brave in what they've accomplished and set up for yeah. you and your family. Can you share a little bit of that background? Yeah, so my father was born in Italy. Um, he came to Australia when he was 16. Um, my mother was born as her family arrived in Australia from Italy. Um, and so I come from, um, I'm a second generation um, Italian Australian. And it's kind of one of those things that like growing up, I always wanted to be Australian. Like I really wanted to fit in. I wanted to have blonde hair, blue eyes. I wanted to eat Vegemite sandwiches. I wanted that <laughs> life. Yeah, like I wanted what you have. Are you saying um, you want to be me, Nick? Okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Not to be human, to be Jenna. Like, yeah. <laughs> Um, I wanted that life. I, I wanted the, you know, a family that didn't have those traditions that was much more like free and easy. And, and I did kind of push back on that a, a, a lot when I was a early teen, but I knew always that I wouldn't change it for the world. Like I, I have such a great family background that's steeped in tradition, cultural understanding. We have traditions that are still lasting. I, I was telling you just before, like, you know, we, we butchered the pig and made the sausages like a couple of weeks ago. We do the wine, we make sauce, you know, all these things that are kind of like pivotal, cultural um, uh, connecting points that um, we are still kind of trying to maintain and we're trying to maintain them for my children as well. Um, in terms of like my family and what they did, like it is so unfathomable to me to do what they did. Like, so my grandfather... So my dad's parents um, and my dad, they're from a place called Kampalataru, which is a small um, village on a mountainside in the Campania region, which is um, near Naples um, in the south of Italy. And um, they were just far they were farmers, um, subsistence farmers. They would make money through livestock and, you know, market gardening, um, no education, um, fought in the war. Um, and my parent, my grandparents had only one child, which was very rare um, in Italy. Um, they had one child, which was my dad. And then my grandfather had to move to the other side of the world <laughs> to go and make a future for his family. Like Italy had been ravaged post World War II. Um, there was the th always the threat of the mafia. There was um, the threat of national conscription, which could you know could conscribe my dad into war at any point if another war you know was to break out which was seemed you know likely at the time um and basically my my grandfather just on a whim uh not on a whim like but on a on a kind of like a hope and a prayer got on a boat and sailed to australia to earn money that he would then send back home um and my grandfather so he moved away when my dad was nine years old and was away for like seven years making money to build a life for my grandfather, grandmother and my dad in Australia. And like, I know it's a common migrant story, but like, I try to think about myself now, like if Paloma, like, you know, I've got a daughter and a son now, if Paloma was nine years old and I just said, all right, babe, I'm going to move to the middle of India, you know, to go and you know, make money, like, and I'll see you when she's a, a young adult. Like, I can't even imagine that. But every day, they every Sunday, he would write a letter that would arrive every week to my grandmother and she couldn't write back because she couldn't write. So he would just be kind of sending letters into the void, hoping that everything was fine. And he kind of travelled up and down Australia, um, laying foundations, laying railroads, picking tomatoes, cutting sugar cane, and uh, eventually built up enough that he could send them money back and say, all right, get on a boat and come to Adelaide. And you know, after, again, after seven years, this young man walks back into his life and it's like, I'm your son, kind of like the bravery that that takes, like the, 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 the faith that that, that takes, the, the trust, the commitment, the, 
the lack of fear, or if you are fear, like harnessing that in a proper, you know, my dad had to give up absolutely every one of his friends, his girlfriends, his, his life back home, his dream. He wanted to be a runner, like all that kind of stuff. He just kind of gave that up to go. He only, the only thing my dad knew about Australia, you know, other than what was in those letters was he had seen one postcard and it was of the houses in Darwin that were on stilts. That was it. The only thing. And he came to Australia thinking that everyone lived in like, on these houses that floated in the sky on the boat over. He saw jelly for the first time, orange juice for the first time, like in these things. And he was just like, had no idea what he was getting himself into. He's when he arrived in Cape town on the journey, he saw squirrels. He was like, what's a squirrel? Like, you know, just, I can't imagine having that little information going back to what you said before about um, we're so bombarded by info and just kind of like on a wing and a prayer going, all right, see ya. Like you've done that before. You've traveled to Africa, but like you've got a search engine. You can look up what what's Africa looks like. We we went to go play Survivor. We can Google what Samoa looks like. Like it's incredible to me. Yeah, it's so hard to imagine to like to even slightly empathize with being in that position. It's just like my brain doesn't even compute because you know I've grown up in basically in that day and age of just being able to access absolutely everything to to yeah. really go on this massive journey into the unknown, like genuinely into the unknown is, yeah, it's absolutely incredible. I know throughout this story because, you know, you can sit here now and like as an adult and have like very clear reflection on how proud you are of your family and everything that they've sort of achieved for you. But that I'm aware when you were a lot younger, there, there sort of was a lack of clarity around this um, in, in growing up and feeling like a little different than other people um, and, and particularly in your relationship to your dad. I know you have a story of kind of like, I suppose, in a way misjudging him because of his background. Yeah. Um, I remember, and it's one of my regrets um, in life, uh, I would look at the kids that I went to school with um, and they, their fathers were educated or semi-educated um they were they spoke english they were able to help with homework you know and i remember once just saying to my dad and i I forget the exact words maybe because i've tried to block it out so many times (laughs) but I, i remember saying to my dad i wish you were like the other dads who could actually help me with things and like oh it's just like what a regret you know to say that to someone who has more life experience than most people I know <laughs> who is bilingual is, you know, he, he, he did have an education. It just wasn't the education that I had. Um, he, he can tell you everything there is to know about farming, about growing up in the country, he, everything there is to know about Italy and the seasons. He, he has all these amazing little factoids about, you know, anything. He can fix absolutely anything with his hands. And here I am saying like, well, you can't help me with my science homework. Like, who are you? And I just feel like that was just such a horrid thing to say. But when you're a kid, you don't see the bigger picture. Um, and obviously I've, we've spoken about this many times. I've apologised to him and he understands and he, didn't, he obviously didn't hold it against me. I was like a you know, 13-year-old kid. But um, I did feel different growing up. Um, you know, it's, I'm only Italian. Like I'm still, you know, Caucasian. You know, I'm not. I don't stand out as much as other people do in terms of um, the racism that I experienced. But I did always feel like my family was different. Like I did always feel like I, you know, couldn't live this kind of carefree, breezy life that my Australian friends lived, um, because we always had tradition and respect is so big in an Italian household. You know. Um, if there's a family function on, and there was always a family function on, like there's always weddings on every weekend, you know, like you have to go and, and it kind of put me at odds with my friends a little bit. Um, and it's just kind of like, as a teenager, you don't actually understand that, but you know, as you grow up, you actually learn that those are the things that have actually nourished me and made me who I am, who've made me human, who've made me like the person I am today that I straddling two cultures isn't easy. Um, but I feel like my whole life, I've always kind of straddled two two kind of lines like what I want to be versus what people expect from me or you know what does it mean to be a man versus an Australian man versus what what my version of masculinity is or you know what does it mean to be you know again even going back to survivor like why I wanted to play survivor versus why other people wanted to play survivor like I feel like I've always been at odds and always been able to kind of hold two binary things in my mind at the same time so 
I think that comes from that. And how do you kind of, how do you manage that? Like holding, because I think most people, right, they kind of have like more of like their authentic self and then they have like this persona or mask that they're kind of like putting on when they go in their day-to-day life to kind of meet, as you're saying, other people's expectations. And obviously as we get older, like we tend to get more wiser. Sort of where are you at right now in terms of like decision-making between what sometimes feels like two worlds? Well, I think I learned early on that I didn't fit in. Like I, I, I feel like I, I, I've never really fit in with, you know, I've got friends and all that and I'm like I'm very comfortable um, with who I am. But I don't think, I think a lot of it comes down to the fact that growing up I wasn't the typical teenage boy. I hated sport. I found it so fucking boring. Sorry, I don't know if I can swear. I, I found it the sport so boring um, and I... Didn't want to do the things that other people did. I loved reading. I loved art. Um, I was, I had this like amazing memory for like really strange facts. <laughs> uh, I was like a bit of a nerd, but like a nerd adjacent. Like I was, I felt like I'm proud to be a nerd, but I also didn't really fit in with nerds either. Like, because, you know, there was some other parts of my personality. I was very, I'm very loud and very outgoing and very outspoken. You know this. Um, and you know, so I didn't fit in with that box and then I didn't fit in with that jocks and I didn't fit in with the, you know, the, 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 whatever, like, so I'm used to not fitting in and it took me a couple of years to realize that that's actually my strength, that, um, um, I like subverting expectations. Um, and I, again, um, to bring it back to a context that we understand in Survivor, um, I went in thinking, okay, I can do this. But I quickly found out that a lot of people did not like me. People did not jive with the way that I presented myself. And I'm sure you can speak to this better than anyone. (laughs) As someone who didn't like me when we first met. (laughs) Um, That I think I was not what people expected. And I remember a a moment where we played survival with a guy called Sam Webb, who is a very typical Australian um, alpha male. Um, He just would look at me and was like, I know so you're a nerd, <laughs> but I can't, yeah, but I can't quite figure you out. You're not, you're not paying deference to me as the alpha male yet. You should, yet you're nice, yet you're a snake, yet you're <laughs> funny, yet you get under my skin. And I just and I, and like it kind of, I felt like it fried his circuits, and he just couldn't figure <laughs> out what to do with me. And 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 I think I've come across a lot of people in my life like that that have been initially like. Who's this? But as our relationship is testament to, I think once you get to know me, you maybe you can speak to it better than than I can. That um, we sometimes judge people on like what they present, and then realize that perhaps what they present is an authentic self or a version of an authentic self that is like attempting to make a connection. I'm not sure. What do you think? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think Survivor is a very difficult. Um, environment to understand somebody's <laughs> authenticity. <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't like push me into a tree and scream in my face about things in real life. <laughs> <Maybe. Hey. laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it's definitely a, a difficult gauge in that sort of environment, but I can certainly say something that I find quite humorous from that experience is that you know, Sue and I were both people that um, we, like as a tripod, as you mean, Sue, we tend to trigger each other in that experience. Um, But what's so hilarious is that now we call each other family and we're very close. So um, yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to dig a little deeper and actually understand how that came about between us being, could absolutely not being able to stand each other to now choosing to have each other um, in each other's lives. It's quite interesting. Well, I kind of feel like what happens is that you recognize yourself in other people and, and everyone, you know, I'm sure everyone can realize this. I, I remember seeing you and thinking, oh, this person's like, a little bit of a bitch, right? <laughs> right? I'll, be honest. I'll be honest. We've spoken about this, right? And I, and I, you remember? I remember you, you thinking like, this guy's a little bit of a dickhead. Like, but what <laughs> we were recognizing is that we both have like cheeky personalities, mm. and like you're not a bitch, and I'm not a dickhead. But like, <laughs> we, we have 
cheeky personalities. We are upfront and really honest and we value authenticity and we value um, real conversations. And what you would trigger in me is a desire to have that. And what I would trigger in you, I think is the same. And I think it's no surprise that the moment the like game conditions were over, the you know, removal of the chasing a mi- half a million dollars and the you know producers and all that, and we went to go live in the Jury Villa, literally like the day that that <laughs> happened, we became like best friends. And, and, and we would call each other like step siblings. Like you are like this person that was thrown into my life in like a step sibling situation. And you're like, oh, I don't really like you. And like <laughs> you, 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 you like them and you want to get to know them, but like there's always that like, mm, but well, like we we should be adversaries because we're we don't want to be in the situation. I want to be with my real family. And then when <laughs> you remove the artifice of that that construction, what's left is two people who are like able to actually recognize, oh, I really like that person. Yeah, I so think, I think no go. Okay. I was just gonna say in relation to that, I think that both you and I were very similar in the sense of like we're thrown into these conditions where at times it it expects you to you know lie cheat still etc and we initially connected because of our authenticity but then being in a game where it's expected if, if you've to do well you you don't always have to be your authentic self and when we called each other okay. out being inauthentic we kind mm. of like got pissed off at each other right yes like, exactly you're the person right. that i rely on for authenticity and now you're not right. being authentic um exactly. and we saw that within each other so yeah and then that just kind of like all fell apart i guess but it's kind of like if we you know if people apply that to other situations how many times have you been in a workplace where you, this person grinds your gears and then you maybe go out for Friday night drinks with the, the, the office and once you're removed from that environment, you're like, oh, I kind of dig that person, right? <laughs> like, you're kind of cool. Once you remove the, the superstructures which kind of trap us sometimes, like work, relationships, so, uh, you know, putting on front for social hierarchy and elevation and all that kind of a game for a half a million dollars. Once you remove that, people are just people, right? And it's quite easy to connect with people. Like even someone who in the game who I, I really didn't like, if, if when I meet them in real life, it's like, oh yeah, cool. Yeah, no, you're fine. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So now that we're on the topic of Survivor, um, one of my most favorite parts of your survivor journey is actually the story before this even came into fruition. And you have a photo on your Instagram that I just love. And it's of you uh, standing on a stump um, for hours. And the story behind is kind of you in this really state of certainty that like, you know, you want to be like the survivor plays and one day this is going to happen for you. Um, Share with me sort of like at that time in your life being so young yet having such a sense of certainty that this is going to be part of your life. Yeah. So survivor started when I was 12 and I was just instantly enamored by the show. Um, Obsessed would talk about it, would watch it. I remember when season two, which was filmed, this is the American Survivor, when it was filmed in Australia, the winner, Tina Wesson, she, uh, when the day after her um, win, there was an article in the newspaper. And I remember like cutting it out as like a 12 year old, putting it on my fridge at home and being like, oh my God, I'm going to do that. I'm going to play Survivor, right? And I remember my family being like, can we get this thing off the fridge? I'm like, no, no, <laughs> this no. random lady on your fridge. <laughs> like, this random lady? I was like, she has to stay. Like, this like, before I even knew what manifesting is, I'm like yeah. manifesting into, into reality. Um, and I just, I loved the adventure of it. As someone who didn't like sports, I felt like it was a way of kind of like, getting physically out there and, and doing things that felt like maybe more in my wheelhouse. I love the social dynamics of it. I love people. I love talking to people. I love learning people's stories. I love human nature. That's why I love reality TV in general. Just like how do people react when you put them in situations? I, I could watch that forever. Like I, 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 there's something so compelling to me when you just, you know, get people from all walks of life and throw them together. So 
I knew from a young kid that I, I, I loved that and I wanted to do it, but I never thought it was like possible because like Australian Survivor, like they tried it when I was like 13 or so, it was a bust, never came back. So I never thought that it was possible. I never thought that Australia would go down that route. But I just had this feeling inside me that like, this is what I'm going to do one day. And it sounds cheesy, right? And like you, you know, I, I, I remember as a kid, as a teenager telling my family and my extended family, like, I love Survivor. Like I remember being like 13, <laughs> being like, I'm going to do a Survivor themed 21st birthday. <laughs> and my family being like, you're not even going to like Survivor by the time you're 21. <laughs> like, it won't even be on the air. And I'd be like, no, 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 I'm going to love it still. And like, <laughs> I'm like it was, and I did. And I had the best Survivor so themed 21st. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. Like the invites were torches and like I made people eat eyeballs and it was, it was great. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so going back to that photo, that's a photo of me on a uh, houseboat holiday down the Murray River. And I'm standing on one of the logs, like the moorings where you tie up the, the houseboat. And I said to my mum, I said, I'm going to go play Survivor uh, out there. And I'm going to see how long I can stand on that pole because that was like a classic Survivor challenge, right? And um, yeah, I did it for hours, just out there for no reason, just because I knew that I could do it. I knew that I could do it. I knew that one day I'd get a chance. <laughs> but then fast forward when Australian Survivor was advertised, the moment I saw the commercial come on, I was like, this is it. It's happening. <laughs> it's happening. And what's really funny is that my ex-girlfriend used to be really into bucket lists, right? That was like her thing. It was like, I remember our first date, we spoke about bucket lists the whole night. And she was like, what's your bucket list? And I was like, oh, my bucket list is to play Survivor. She was like, okay, yeah, cool. We spoke about that. And she's like, what else? And I was like, no, that's it. She's like, what do you mean? Like a bucket list is a list, you idiot. Like it's going to have multiple items on it. And I said, well, I don't want to create a bucket list because I know I will never achieve my number one goal. And it makes me upset. <laughs> He's like the existential dread of like this, you know. <laughs> This, what is the, the, the meaning of life other than being on Survivor? Yeah, right. Like, you know, <laughs> this is and it's why not even I about like being, Yeah. It's not even about like it wasn't about being on TV or anything like that. It was about this thing that got me through, you know, when my mum was sick, we would sit down together and watch her. I would say to her, I'm gonna do that one day. And she was like the only person who ever actually was like, Yes, you will, Nick. You know, everyone else was like, Nick, shut the hell up. Like, <laughs> I was like, oh. that's what got me through that. It was like, you know, a way that I connected with some friends, like. I don't know, it just meant a lot to me. And I, I just really wanted it because of all those reasons. So when I so I never kind of planned for anything else in life. I was like, well, I'm not gonna have goals. Like that's you know, not that sounds dramatic, but I'm not gonna have like these big goals like climb Mount Everest or blah blah blah. Because what's the point? Like those things never happen. So like, so then when I got to play Survivor and did go out there, I remember coming maybe even speaking about it out there, but coming back and going, holy crap, like anything is actually possible. Like it's the it's the most overdone axiom in life. Anything is possible. And like we hear it and we tell our students this, we tell our kids this and we tell each other, and we write it on our mirrors and all this stuff. But like I never believed it until that moment that like if there is something that I want bad enough, I can make it happen. And that was an incredibly liberating experience for me because what that meant is that I came back and I actually wrote a bucket list. I read a list of all these things that I wanted to do. I want to write a poem every year. I'm going to, I want to write a, uh, I want to write a book. I want to, um, you know, have kids. I want to travel to this destination. I want to set up this founder, you know, I want all these things. And now like, I know that if I, I really want to do them, I can make it happen. Like I was even watching, what was it? I was watching with Paloma the other night. Like, a, like, I don't know. It was like frozen or something like that. And, oh, Cause she's into movies at the moment, like kids movies. And I remember thinking like, God, I want to be like it. How cool would it be to be an animator, right? And like write movies, kids movies. And I actually thought in my head, like, I'm sure if I really committed myself, I could get there. No, I don't want, I don't really want to do that. But like, I would never have had that thought process before Survivor, ever, ever. So it's amazing. That's incredibly powerful and certainly inspires me to have that sort of sense of certainty coming at the other end of Survivor and just being like, I can genuinely do anything that I want to do. Um, yeah, and people, people like, people mock reality TV and people like, 
I'm sure there are people listening to this now that's like, chill out, buddy. Like, it's just a show. There He's are obsessed, thousands- guys. He's obsessed, okay? <laughs> it's not even that, right? Like, it's not even that. It's like I always respect people who have a passion, right? And, like, I, one of the things I always say to Christine is that I hope Paloma has, like, a niche interest, whether it's, like, bird watching or Hungarian <laughs> folk dancing or <laughs> she's really into mosaics. I don't know. Like I hope she has this niche interest that she can have a passion and she can be committed to it because I'm of the strong belief that if something is important to you, no matter what it is, it should be important to the people who love you. And I teach students who want to be gamers, who want to have YouTube channels, who want to you know do all these things that like, as an adult, I'm like, okay, how about we get a real profession? But like then, but then I'm actually like, no, hold on a second, that is a real profession. And it's important to this kid. And then I put aside that initial snap judgment and I'm like, all right, how do we get you there? Like, what do you need to know? Like, what are the steps that we can take? Like, what are the safeguards? Because if it's important to that person, it should be important to the people who care for that person. And as their teacher, I should care for them. So I, I've, I've never liked when people kind of are dismissive of the fact that it's it's just Survivor, it's just a reality show. Like, of course it's just a reality show. It's artificial, it's edited, you know, it's a true experience, but, like, you know, there are all these caveats around it, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's important to me. So that my family know that and they support that, and that's why when something's important to my wife, no matter what it is, I stop everything and commit to that because it's what is kind of like pushing her through day to day. Yeah, that's so beautiful. And I think particularly you being a teacher, like I'm, you know, clapping inside because, you know, I think particularly growing up, I think things are changing. But when I was in high school, it was a very linear way of doing things. And personally, I ended up studying a degree for two degrees for five and a half Mm -hmm. years that I have learned skill sets from, but I certainly don't use in a professional manner. (laughs) And I got into that thinking that that was what I was meant to do I didn't actually really reflect on the more passionate side of things um and that you know that's part of the evolution but I think there's something so beautiful in in freely encouraging people to explore their passions and sort of along the lines of you know your mother's advice is to just like you know get go out there and figure it out like you might like something now and be really passionate about something now but there may be many things in your life and I'm sure for you Nick um, particularly having been on Survivor twice now, like it obviously still is a really big passion for you, but maybe it's making room, as you said, with your bucket list to to begin exploring other facets of life as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and now that I've done it, particularly that I've done it twice, which was, you know, like I feel like I've squeezed everything I can out of the Survivor experience. I've been so lucky. I've started a podcast and all this you know, um, and now um, Channel 10, working for Channel 10 and going and contributing to Talking Tribal, you know, having all these amazing experiences, it's it's pushed me now to try the next thing. And, like, I do know that I one day will write a novel. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, now, whether that novel's any good is a completely <laughs> different story. Whether anyone reads it doesn't matter. Like I will write a novel one day. Like I, and I know that in the every fibre of my being and it might be printed out and then put into a chest that when I'm dead, Paloma can take it out and read it. P- totally fine with me. But I know that I will do that and I wouldn't have done that before. But kind of going back to what you're saying about, you know, kids these days, I do feel like there is a lot of pressure on people and I know we've all experienced this a lot of pressure to get the career, go the linear path. But I feel like it's actually students put it on themselves. Like there's how many times I speak to a year 11 student and because I'm an English teacher, I'm very passionate about my subject. I'm always like, well, are you doing, you're so good at English. Like, are you going to do English next year in year 12? They're like, I really want to, it's my favorite subject. And they're not just saying that because they're talking to me. Like you can see it in their brain. <laughs> and my favorite it. teacher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, it's like, you know, they, they, these are kids who write poetry on the weekend, kids who, you know, always reading, talking to me about books. And, and they're like, it's my favourite subject, but, like, I don't need it for my course, so I'm not going to do it. And it's like, no, 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 no. 
we have to be pragmatic as teachers and we have to know, recognize that kids need skills to get into courses and things. That's why I'm always of the belief that when students are selecting subjects is that like, if you've got to do five subjects in year 12, four of them can be pragmatic, but there has to be one wish fulfillment subject. Whether that's, you know, you're aiming for an ATAR of 99.9 .9 and going and into medicine, you know, if you really want to do woodwork, do it offline at another campus or, you know, do it, you know, we can, we can figure out a way to get you to do that. Or if, if you want to do English, aim aspirationally to choose the more difficult English, not the one that you know you're going to get the 20 for, for your course. So it's something that pervades everyone's life to some degree. And it's, I think it's important to kind of like cut kids off of the pass before they get into that belief that they're not going to be able to follow through. And that if they one day want to like be a triathlete or, you know, you know, create a YouTube channel, or, you know, climb Mount Everest or whatever, like it's okay to foster those passions as well as having a more pragmatic, realistic sense of who you're going to be. Yeah. It's so important to not also feel stuck in your decision-making um, you know, I, I think there is a lot of power of being very strong in, in your decision making and staying with it. But I think particularly when you're young and you're exploring, if you go into university and decide one sort of, you know, one way and then within a couple of years decide that this isn't for you, that that's OK, that you don't have to yeah. stay with it just for the sake of finishing something. Well, people always, as a, again, not to make this all about education, but people always reference like the, the high dropout rates in the first few years of uni. And look at that in like, oh, kids can't commit, you know, oh, we, you know, what a waste of money and time. We need better education. It's like, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like, sure, it's not ideal. We would love kids to know what they want to do and contribute, you know, that towards their passion, you know, from forever. But we know that that's not the case. And I don't think that's a bad thing. You should be able to kind of chop and change. Like, if I decide tomorrow that, like, I never want to be associated with Survivor again and that period of my life is done and I'm never going to play and I'm never going to watch and that's totally fine like that's because I've evolved to that point now I don't think I will but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay if I did want to you know mm -hmm. and as a teacher and this is just sort of more of a personal interest of mine um, particularly in teaching kids sort of more in the year 11 year 12 grades um, I hear of a lot more with children facing sort of mental health challenges, quote unquote, um, particularly in the realm of anxiety, social anxiety, depression. How do you as a teacher, um, I suppose, like help kids with that? Do you have protocols or are you able to sort of like humanize this experience and bring in your own life experience? Yeah, I definitely, definitely. Obviously, there's lots of, you know, issues around duty of care with what you share with, with students. But I think that the students that I've had the most success with, whether they are struggling or not struggling, it's about creating that kind of human connection. Um, I can come in and I can fumble my way through what Macbeth is about and I can write quotes up on the board and we can, I can tell a kid how to write a topic sentence. And I do think that that is primarily what I'm there to do. Like I'm not someone who's like, education comes second, teach the kid only. It's like, no, I think that they need to be both, right? Like I think I need to go in there and always have high standards about, you know, this is how you use a comma and this is what Killer Mockingbird is about. But if I'm not catering to that kid as a person, that, that information is never going to cut through. And I think that I have the most success through sharing parts of my life, you know, appropriate parts of my life, being vulnerable. Um, if there's something that's happening in the news, um, talking about it with the kids, allowing them to talk to you, um, being accessible to kids as well is a huge thing I've noticed. Some kids don't want to talk when you want to talk to them. They want to talk when they've built up the courage to talk to you. And this is, you know, I've had kids who've come out to me, kids who've talked about their, you know, their really tough home life, kids who've admitted to struggling or kids who are just really happy and just want to kind of like, you know, chat about what's going on in their life. They want to do that when they want to do that. And if that means that they send you an email saying, hey, are you free at recess? If you're not free at recess, you kind of have to figure out a way to be free at recess, right? Whether that's like, hey, come with me. I'm actually going to be on yard duty. And I usually, while I'm doing yard duty, I just kind of like do a couple of laps of the oval. Do you mind coming for a walk with me and, and making that time accessible for those kids? They appreciate that so much because you're, you're showing them that 
when they come to school that you're not there just to tip a textbook into their head. You're there to kind of like look them in the face while tipping a textbook in the head. <laughs> so I think that's kind of where I've found success. And I know my wife's a teacher and that's where she's way better at this than I am. She's a head of house which means that she is pastorally responsible for a, a huge number of children. And she, she makes amazing inroads with kids um, through kind of connecting with them and kind of like being there for them in a stern yet friendly, um, accessible, um, genuine, genuine way. And kids are absolute, kids are the best bullshit detectors. <laughs> they know when you're being disingenuous. They know when you're phoning it in way better than adults do. Like I work with people that I feel like I can phone it in with them because we're all kind of so busy. But kids are in there very much aware of the energy that people bring to them and you can't pull the wool over their eyes. They know when you're trying to fob them off. (laughs) And sometimes when you're really busy, you kind of want to fob them off, but you just can't. Mm. And it works though, it helps. That's my, I don't know, that's my experience as a teacher. Yeah, I think there's a... um beautiful sense of responsibility that teachers hold I know in my experience um, there's one particular teacher that just was really there for me throughout my high school experience and to this day I still see her every time I sort of go back to where I grew up and I, I see these two paths and I see one path where she didn't sort of come along and give me guidance yeah. and one path where she did. And they are so profoundly different, just totally yeah. different trajectories. And for me, I've always just had so much admiration um, and respect for teachers that give the kids, as you're saying, sort of the, the time, but also that human aspect um, of connection that really can be when, when kids are sort of yearning from it, um, can be so defining in their lives. And I think there's also power, and this relates to, you know, even as a parent now, but mostly as a teacher, knowing when you're not the person for that kid. I think we, um, a lot of people get into teaching because we romanticise this ideal of being this person who's going to transform lives and you're going to change kids forever. You know, that's not the case obviously. (laughs) Uh, And there have been kids that you don't get along with or kids that you can't bring that for them, whether they're not ready or you don't have the skill set, or they don't need it or what you are providing isn't going to fit. And I think part of it is also knowing when to call that um, and knowing when you can't be there for that person. And, and, but the crucial part, and this relates to, you know, even as a parent, like I know when, if Paloma is, having a crisis because, you know, something that's happened to rock her two-year-old world. I know when <laughs> I'm going to be the one that's going to be able to help her and I know the one when Christine's going to be the one who's going to be able to help her. But the key is not going, all right, well, I can't help you, so good luck, go find Mr Smith down the road. It's knowing that I can't help you, I'll help you get to where you need to be and I'm always going to be waiting in the wings. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's kind of like friendship, right? Like, you know, if you've got a friend that you haven't seen in a very long time, that doesn't mean that you're not there for them. It means that you're just kind of like waiting in the wings for like when they actually kind of need you. And what's it been like for you? Because obviously you're someone that children look up to and you're a mentor well, figure. Not all children. Let's do <laughs> <laughs> Some children. I'm trying to pump you up here. <laughs> Thank you. And you're trying to pull yourself down. <laughs> Uh, that's a, the little imposter coming through again, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, there's, there's definitely kids that see you as a mentor and look up to you, but obviously being someone that has been a reality television contestant and has been on that journey of entertainment, how on earth do you come to manage that? Mm, yeah, it was one of my biggest fears, to be honest. I was never afraid of what the people on the island would think unless it kind of ruined the game for me. <laughs> but I was never afraid of what my family would think. I was never afraid of what Twitter and the general public would, afraid, uh, would think. The only people I ever genuinely were worried about to the point where I was questioning whether it was the right thing to, to go and play was my students and my school community um, and about what the long-lasting effect would be on my career, which is my vocation. It's this fundamental part of who I am. Um, I can't imagine what life would be like if I was told I couldn't teach anymore. So how do I, how did I manage that? I think it was about being, being 
um, honest with it, getting in front of the story. Uh, and what I mean by that is that when I came back from Survivor the first time, while we were still in Samoa, where it was announced that I was going to be playing, I came back and kids had made Facebook pages, you know, cheering on Mr. Adams and all this kind of stuff. Like I knew that there was interest in it. Um, everyone was really positive, but I, I wanted, so I, uh, I asked my principal if I could speak to the whole school community at the assembly. And I did like a presentation on, you know, this is why I did it. This is what Survivor means to me. Um, and told them the stories, some of the stories that I've told you, told here today, um, and really made people view it. And I did talk about this idea that it, and I, I remember even saying in that assembly that this is something that's important to me for these reasons. And if there is something that's important to you, it should be celebrated. And I tried to make them shift from thinking this is someone who's going on TV to run around in their underwear, to lie, cheat and steal, to this is someone who is complete wish fulfillment, filling out a dream. So it it shifted the narrative to people could really get behind my story. And the other thing is, is I was never, I'm never embarrassed. I was never embarrassed. Well, I did some cringe things. I was embarrassed of like <laughs> cringe things, but not embarrassed of being on reality TV. I was not embarrassed of playing Survivor. And I feel like that there is a kind of um, thing that all Survivor players go through, and, you know, I'm sure you've gone through this as well, where you're like, I don't really want people to know that I did it. Like in some context, I would prefer if no one recognised me. Like I've gone on conferences before where I'm presenting about, you know, literature and I'm speaking to like a, a – a group of peers who I respect. And then there's people, you can see them going like, oh my God. I'm like, and I'm like, and in my head, I'm like, please don't tell anyone. Like, not because I'm embarrassed, because I don't want it to filter into this, what I'm doing in this moment. Once I finish presenting, come chat to me and I'll, I'll be all about it. But so I think what was important was never being embarrassed of what I did and always kind of like saying, yeah, I absolutely love playing Survivor. Like it was the best. And there were, you know, there were nights where, you know, things were a little bit dicey on Twitter and, but it was about coming in the next day and if kids would go, oh, my God, I can't believe you did that, I'd be like, I know, right? Like how strange was that? Like <laughs> this was but ne- and, and giving people the latitude to not be interested in Survivor, that was another thing that was really big for me. Um, I thought that everyone would be like, oh, my God, my teacher's on TV. If my teacher was on TV, I'd be like out of sheer curiosity, like what? And I'd be watching along. Some kids just didn't care totally fine some kids really cared totally fine some parents were like initially a little bit and that's totally fine too and some parents come to parent teacher interviews and go yeah yeah, i'm not here to talk about jack (laughs) tell me about tell me about the challenge you know like you know you have to you have to be authentic with each of those people and not be embarrassed of people's reaction and i think that goes a long way in normalizing what you do and making people also kind of come on the journey with you yeah, I remember um, obviously the, one of the more iconic moments of season one was when you and I weren't very friendly with each other on the beach. And <laughs> I remember I rem- that. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember when it was shown that night, because obviously I, I think people forget that, you know, we have our experience out in Survivor. And then actually when it's being released, we're seeing it for the first time and it's obviously edited because they can't show 24 hours a day of footage. So we sort of go into that, into the unknown of like, okay, we know that this is going to be on, but how is it going to go down? And I know from that particular scenario, there was very polarizing comments from both sides from both fans and you and I had to connect and be like all right we we need to do a bit of crisis management here um particularly for me I was concerned about you being a teacher I like that was like the 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 warning bell that was sort of happening in my head is like we kind of we have to sort of approach this in a united front and I think both you and I shared on our Facebook pages just being like very clear about the situation and where we were at that point in time and where we were then like as a friendship. Um, And I think it was very important to have to do that because otherwise people sort of run along with these different narratives that just simply aren't true. Yeah. And I remember, I remember like when I was, when we had that fight, my family wanted to be like, Oh, Jen is the worst. I'm like, no, 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 you're actually not like, you know, I did see the wedding. (laughs) You'll see her soon. You can tell her to her. Yeah. <laughs> um, or seeing, you know, 
the what the Facebook the survivor page had put up and seeing you know seeing looking at the comments and seeing students people that I've used to teach like them as well and it's just like you know making sure that the 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 message was clear that you know um, it was a situation that doesn't carry on into real life and kind of like also owning it as well like only like I said before like owning the experience like yeah like we had a fight like yeah fights with everyone like this is just you know sometimes you just don't have twelve cameras filming it you know. Yeah, I think um, part of like the processing and experience like like that is just to be able to have a laugh at it at the end of the day can feel so real um, in that moment. And I think particularly as you're aware, it's, it's very difficult for people that haven't been through that experience to truly understand how challenging it can be emotionally out there and that you do behave in in odd ways and you kind of have to own that when you get back to but to be able to laugh and humanize that experience I think is really important it's like one of the you know rare times when every every sense every faculty is fizzing inside you like you are constantly aware of your safety you're constantly aware of what you're saying, you've got the hunger pains, you're excited, you're scared, you're nervous, you're embarrassed, you're this, you're that. <laughs> like when you're playing Survivor and having done it twice, I kind of knew to prepare for the second time that yeah. there would be just this constant um, roiling bubble inside of like all these different feelings. Um, and I think that's so exhilarating. Like I, the re- one of the reasons I wanted to play again and initially, I, I, you know, I've told you this before, but initially I did kind of, toy with the idea of saying no because I was at a different stage of my life and all these things were happening in my personal life and um, uh, I had had a great experience the first time but one of the things that eventually got me to say yes was that recognition that like I feel like I'll be higher the whole time like I'll be like I'll be I'll be um, firing on all cylinders and I feel, I'll feel really human and alive and the sadness that I feel will be really sad, like if I'm voted out, and the elation that I'll feel if I win or win a challenge or find an idol will be really high, and the shame that I'll feel if I embarrass my daughter will be really high, but the pride that will, you know, and and I think that it's really, again, we talk about what it means to be human, is like to be human is to be alive, and I feel like um, I feel really alive when I'm playing Survivor, like, you know, I feel dead because I'm hungry, but like, I feel really, really alive. Like I just feel this, this constant fizz inside me that is, um, um, that I wish everyone could experience. And, and I've experienced it in other parts of my life, you know, when I'm, with, when I'm with my family or when you have a great moment in the classroom or, you know, that, that kind of stuff. But yeah, it is, it's this palpable sense of being alive that makes you feel like I'm where I need to be right now. Yeah, I think that's one of the more fortunate things about Survivor as a reality television show that a lot of other reality television shows don't get is to be out in the elements, is to be, you know, doing challenging things with a, with a group of people that are having to band together to survive on the show. Like I think there's there's that element that I think you get that release and you can move through that experience and you feel so alive that a lot of other reality television show contestants have a lot of challenges in, in, in being on a television show like that, but it's, it's almost like all of their energy kind of gets cooped up and it's, it's not able to sort of have that outlet that we do out in that. Yeah, definitely. And like everything is just heightened, like, you know, and, and it's just like, it's such a surreal experience that like, you know, if you, you know, you've spoken to athletes and, you know, that, that you go on these journeys where you have these moments that if you didn't take a risk and go out, you would never have them. And, you know, one of the ones, you know, you were there for it um, was um, pre-merge phase, still two tribes just before the merge going into a challenge where our tribe had been winning so much that I was like, I don't need to participate today. I can sit out because I'm really not feeling that great. I'm feeling a bit sick. I'm good. We get to the challenge and we realize that it's basically a hero challenge for one person to have to do a puzzle, run out, pull a boat, you know, do all this kind of stuff. And I felt like I was the person who sat in the middle of the Venn diagram in the tribe who could do the physical and the puzzle. So I was like, everyone's like, all right, Nick, I guess you're doing it. And I remember thinking, oh God, I really don't want to do it. And it was one of the lower moments of the game. But then straight away, the rain comes down and while we're waiting, 
before the challenge starts. I remember we huddled under that tree. Uh, I think you you were on the bench. So the people who were playing were, were huddled under this tree. And as they were saying, like, it's okay, like, you know, your mum's here. She's going to be watching over you. About 2,000 butterflies burst out of the tree we were standing under and just took off into the rain. And it's like, wow, like, I'm alive. Like, there is something greater happening here about my connection to this moment, my connection to my mum. I've always seen butterflies as a symbol, as many people do, butterflies as a symbol of her. Um, and I was just like, when will I ever get these experiences again? Like, all right, I'm ready. Let's do it. And, you know, we won and it was amazing and all this great stuff. But, like, I wouldn't have got that if I hadn't have actually taken that step to chase the feeling of being alive and even saying yes. Like, I could have said no and I could have said, you know, Jenna, you do the thing or Lee, you do it. I could have done that. But I said yes. And by saying yes, I went and found out for myself what can happen. And what can happen is I can have this amazing moment that I'll never forget of watching those thousand butterflies fly off into the sky. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And I think particularly for, you know, obviously we're talking about Survivor. So people that have been on Survivor, they get really nostalgic for that experience. And like yeah. I've always advised, you know, obviously part of the nostalgia is the Survivor experience, but I feel like on a deeper level, so much more of that is like just getting out into life. And as you're saying, like yeah. saying yes to things that you'd normally say no to, get out of your comfort zone, sort of see what you're made out of, like you're made of, you know, similar to what your mom advises, like go out there and figure it out. And I know certainly like with Sue, obviously we've stayed really good friends with her and I've mustered her to come do um, Nepal base camp with me next year. Might not happen because of COVID. Um, but at some point we're going to be doing that because it's it's the doing challenging things out in nature with each other is like really like it's just such a consistent theme and pattern amongst people where it's just like, yes, that is when I feel most alive is when I'm doing those things. And as, as you're saying, having that opportunity of like, you know, hundreds or thousands of, of beautiful butterflies representing like the, the essence of your mother, like it's, it's just so beautiful. And I think a lot of people who stay in their comfort zone truly miss out on experiences like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I'm someone who's never wanted to, Go, go out into nature and hike or anything like that I've never been interested in that and then playing Survivor again it kind of maybe unlocked a little bit of that and then I started reading that you know I read that book about the lady who hikes the Pacific Crest Trail and you know and that just kind of was like maybe I can do that I probably can't but like you know I can give it a crap you yeah. definitely can and I mean it just when you speak like that it, it reminds me of the Nick that I first met that never identified as someone that you know was a physical uh, had physical attributes that were worthy of like being helpful in a team or anything. And I feel like now, like a Nick post two survivor experiences has done has such a different headspace of what you're capable of because you were put in positions where you had really no choice, but to give it a go and see what you were made of. Yeah, definitely. And I've, uh, I've said on many podcasts before that, like I went into survivor thinking that of the three pillars of the game, the strategy, the social and the physical, that, you know, strategy, I've got on lock, social, I've got on lock, and the physical, I'm going to really struggle. And then after season one, I'm like, oh, boned the strategy a few times, you know, boned the social a few times. And I was left with the physical was the thing that kind of got me through. And it's like, well, we don't know what we're capable of, right? Like we think we know what we're capable of. That little voice inside your head says what you're not going to be able to do. And it's just a voice. It's not, it's not the core of who you are. So being a father of two now, Throughout your experience, and I, I won't just keep this to Survivor, but but all of your life and, and all of the adversity and beautiful things that you've overcome and, and grown through, right now, if Palermo Articus were to ask you, Dad, you know, what is this most important piece of advice that I could have, what would it be? I feel like, you know, not to be repetitive, but I would give them what my mum said. I would say go and find out for yourself. And I... It's funny because the other night we, Christine and I were watching the, um, the the documentary on Netflix called like, The College Admission Scandal, the one about the, the families that paid for their kids to go to Harvard and stuff. And I was sitting there and I was like, oh, God, I was like, I hope Paloma wants to go to Harvard or wants to go and study and do all this stuff. And Christine was like, Paloma will do what she wants to do. And like, <laughs> no matter what you say you want her to do, she's going to do it. And I was like, oh, yeah, no, that's so true. Like, I do genuinely... 
I do now, now I know having the experiences that I have had that I want her to go out and, and, and find out for herself. Like I would be so sad if she, you know, decided to move out when she was 18 to the other side of the world. And, but like, I would be really proud of that. So like my advice would be against my better judgment of leaving, having my daughter leave home would be like, you should go out there and you should, Go and find something. And the other advice would be I'd, I'd, I'd like her to find a passion. Um, and I don't think you can find a passion. Some people don't have a passion um, and some people haven't found their passion yet. So I think as a parent, what my job will be, more than what it, my job as a teacher is, is to expose my children to things, as many things as possible, that if they don't follow through and they don't do them, that's fine but I do want to give her the opportunity to say yes or no. Like we take her to art class, we take her to music, you know, Christine takes her to music class. Um, you know, we do cooking with her, trying to find like, what are the things that are going to be interesting and always presenting the big wheel of options. Um, yeah, and like when she's old enough, like I'm not a sports person, I, I don't like sport, but I'll take her to netball, I'll take her to basketball. And the moment she's not interested, that's fine, But I want her to have as many experiences as possible so that she can then say, yeah, this is the thing for me. And hopefully she has a niche interest, like I said, and Atticus as well. So thank you for this beautiful conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed connecting with you. And thank you, it's so fun. A, it has been, it's been so lovely yeah. to connect and have a laugh. So on a final note, I would love to ask you, what does it mean to you, Nick, to be human? To be human? is i'll piggyback off what my mom said again to be human is to find out for yourself going out there finding out what it means to be human someone else can't tell you i can't tell you this podcast can push you in the right direction but it can't tell you the answer because everyone's answer is different right so my belief is that to be human is to figure that answer out for yourself and i'm going to take that profound note that my mom gave me and and and, and run with that <laughs>